Oyster tonging on Apalachicola Bay. Few things symbolize the forgotten coast like Apalachicola oysters and the men and women who harvest them. But these aren't Apalachicola oystermen. Babies. Babies. <laughs> I'm a baby oyster. This is a Florida State University biology class taught by Dr. Randall Hughes. Today, Dr. Hughes is having her colleague, Dr. David Kimbrough, lead her class on a field trip to learn about the Apalachicola oyster fishery. 10, 11, 12. You got just enough for a dozen raw oysters yeah. at the raw bar. <laughs> Dr. Hughes and Dr. Kimbrough study coastal ecosystems at the FSU Coastal and Marine Laboratory. Dr. Hughes is conducting a study on biodiversity in salt marshes. Both she and Dr. Kimbrough are part of a study on oyster reefs. They and colleagues across the southeast are examining predation and how fear may help keep balance in these important habitats. These images represent an important part of Florida's identity. It's rooted in over a thousand miles of coastline made up of various interdependent ecosystems. It's a coast that provides food, recreation, and jobs. But while many people reap the benefits of these systems, how many people really know them? I get in the heel. There it is. You get a platter of half shells and you want to know where do these come from? What do they look like when they're not on our platter? What oysters are are, are kind of like coral reefs. There's this massive structure that's built on dead organism, like lots of dead oyster shells. And then there's a living veneer of live animal that kind of congeals this whole dead habitat into one sort of solid unit. And so the oysters that are on your platter used to be on the top veneer uh, of the oyster reef. Also, it's not just this one solid reef. There are all sorts of nooks and crannies in this reef. This nook is a stone crab burrow. Stone crabs are well camouflaged on an oyster reef, as are many of the other species found there. Oyster reef species look enough like oysters that one really has to get up close to see that there is anything going on. The habitat that neighbors many intertidal reefs also benefits from a closer look. I think most people have probably seen a salt marsh. You drive by them along any coastline around here and, and they just look like these big kind of monotonous meadows. You just see what looks like just one you know, big mass of green grass out there. But actually, especially as you approach from the water's edge, you'll notice that there's actually a mix of different plants that are there, some that are tall, some that are short. and then you'll see undoubtedly lots of snails. If the water is in at all, the snails will be climbing up any, usually plants, but anything they can climb up to escape the water. Much like an oyster reef houses a variety of species in its nooks and crannies, a salt marsh conceals and nourishes life within its chutes. This man fishing between a salt marsh and an oyster reef is taking advantage of an ecosystem service provided by both systems. That service is providing habitat for varied animal species, many of which are consumed by humans. Juvenile fish such as mullet use the marsh as shelter, while full-grown predatory fish like redfish and catfish come to oyster reefs to feed. Blue crabs make use of both habitats, and oysters themselves are harvested for human consumption. But oysters have value beyond their tastiness. By filtering in the water and searching for algal food, they clean a lot of stuff out of the water. And so that then helps things that need a lot of light in the water to grow, like seagrass beds. And seagrass beds are hugely important because lots of valuable things live within seagrass beds. When algae accumulates, it darkens water and cuts off the sunlight that seagrass needs to grow. Marshes do their part in filtering nutrients as well. Because marshes occur between the land and the water, anything running off the land that would go into the bay or the ocean or the gulf 
often gets filtered out by the marsh. Salt marsh grasses and oysters are foundation species. They not only shelter other species, they feed some of them. Species that feed directly on cordgrass or oysters are in turn consumed by larger predatory species. Defining these relationships is key in understanding how habitats function. One of the first things you want to know when you go out in a system is, is who is eating whom. Um, and so that kind of defines trophic levels. So you can have uh, plants, or sometimes it's called basal resources, because it doesn't have to be a plant. It could be an oyster. It could be kind of the bottom of the food chain. The things that are most abundant, like plants, are at the bottom, and they're getting their energy directly from the sun. And so the oysters are getting their energy from the plants or the algae. And then you'll have smaller crabs or snails or organisms that eat those bottom resources, those plants. And then it just kind of works its way up. Finally to the point where you get to these large predatory fishes, there are a lot fewer of them biomass or numbers wise than there are plants way down at the bottom. The biomass distribution of an ecosystem is loosely shaped like a triangle. Though top predators are the smallest group, they exert pressure on species of all levels. One way they do this is through a process known as a trophic cascade. Trophic cascade concept you know, has been powerful for since the 1960s. You have lots of top predators, you won't have many um, intermediate consumers and you'll have more plants. If you don't have any top consumers, then you'll have lots of intermediate consumers and fewer plants. In a salt marsh, blue crabs are the top predator. These periwinkle snails are the intermediate consumer and then the, the marsh cordgrass is kind of the, the resource or the plant at the bottom of this food web. Usually plants at the bottom, then consumers of plants at the intermediate trophic level like your deer or herbivores and then carnivores. But on oyster reefs, the thing at the bottom of the pyramid are the oysters, and they're not plants, they're animals, right? And so they're actually eating phytoplankton or algae in the water. The trophic level above oysters is occupied by animals such as mud crabs and small snails known as oyster drills. Those are in turn consumed by larger crabs and fish. But who are the top predators on David and Randall's study reefs? Finding out was a major objective in the first year of their study. Their mission in doing so was not only to determine who was eating whom, but who was scaring whom. The eating is called a consumptive predatory effect. So we've gone from just thinking about food webs as being organized purely through consumption to food webs are also regulated a lot by fear and the non-consumptive effects of predators. You know, consumption just affects one prey individual. Fear can affect everybody. For example, these snails, um, if they are getting lots of cues that blue crabs are around, sometimes even when the tide goes out and they should be able to climb down and eat other resources on the sediment surface, they may decide that really the, th the threat of getting eaten by a blue crab is just too high and they're just gonna hang out up on the plant. There's much to fear for the marsh periwinkle. Its shell is easily infiltrated by a crown conch proboscis and is easily cracked by the claws of a blue crab. Its best defense is altitude. They aren't necessarily fast, but they're fast enough to escape larger snails, like crown conchs. This hermit crab occupies a vacant periwinkle shell, a grim reminder of what happens to snails who don't climb fast enough. Unlike the blue crab, a crown conch is a threat to periwinkles, even at low tide. Periwinkles are only truly safe when they are up and out of the water, happily resting on cord grass or needle rush shoots. I didn't see a crab. What are we looking at on oyster reefs? And it all kind of spawned through uh, work we all did a long time ago in North Carolina, just examining indirect benefit of predators on oysters, but we did it in these real small artificial tanks. Now we're trying to take it out into sort of the real world and see, you know, the real world's so complicated compared to these little tanks where we did these studies a decade ago. Does this stuff about fear and indirect effects, does it really, is it really important out in nature? In the oyster study, we've focused most on the ones that are 
called fringing reefs or occur right here along the edge of a salt marsh because that's really some of the dominant ones that are left these days and the healthiest ones that are left. The reefs that they and their colleagues are studying span from North Carolina to the Florida Gulf, with Randall and David leading the Florida team. Up in North Carolina on oyster reefs, you might have different predators than you do down here. So we don't want to find a story on oyster reefs and wave our arms all around about it and try and make everyone aware of it as if it's happening on all oyster reefs, when in fact, perhaps it's not. So we wanted to do the same sorts of studies, not only in the field, but to do it at sites from North Carolina to Florida. This is not a small undertaking. With five reefs at every study site, they are looking at 60 reefs over the span of 1,000 kilometers. Over three years, they hope to gain a definitive understanding of the ecology of fear on oyster reefs and how it influences oyster filtration. But first, they have to get out there. You know, I saw this relatively good looking oyster reef habitat in Alligator Harbor, and especially because I'm not from this area, I had no clue on how to access it. The mud is like quicksand in some spots, and so, you know, I was just ignorantly and naively thought I could just walk straight out when, you know, I sank almost up to my waist and uh, almost did a face plant in the mud to quickly realize I couldn't go that route. I quickly learned how to make things more efficient. And so by the next you know, couple of missions, we were kayaking, which was first determined because I tried to take a boat to get to these areas. The, the water's too shallow to bring a boat in. So, okay, you can't walk, you can't boat, let's kayak. David and his newly assembled crew got to work on their goals for year one. We wanted to first monitor the environment and the food web on oyster reefs from North Carolina down to Florida for at least a year, just to establish if the players differ uh, in each of the ball games and or does the environment differ. So to see if our reef is you know, thriving, we wanna make sure we got, in addition to a lot of small guys, a lot of adults. The first sampling looked to define the lower trophic levels. By just going and basically excavating this huge area of oyster reef, we systematically work through everything living and non-living in that sample. An oyster reef is purely dominated by really small oysters, and they're few, then that reef's not doing very well. But if instead, in this patch of oysters that you just harvested, if there are tons of oysters and they're all large, and you got some small ones, then you know that not only are oysters sort of living long enough to reach maturity, but they also have a new crop coming in behind them to eventually replace them. So it's a self-sustaining reef. But then we also want to know what sort of things are living within this reef, both to use it as habitat and food. So were there lots of mud crabs? Were there more abundant down in Florida than North Carolina? Were there a lot of snails? Are there fewer over here on the Gulf than there are in the Atlantic? Those are the sorts of things we were looking at by harvesting up that reef. The other sampling we do every three months to look at sort of the predatory fishes and crabs on our reef, that's less all on camera, invasive and destructive. And so we do that every three months. Under turbid water, this gill net will be nearly invisible to the large predatory fish and crabs that make use of the reefs. Pot is empty. And crab trap one was empty. We're gonna bust the dock today with our, uh, <laughs> got it, all right, with our catch. They had better luck with their gill nets than with their traps that day. God, there have been so many surprises. The first one, which just really threw me for a loop because I'm not from here, was the fact that these reefs in the summertime in particular are dominated by catfish. When you think catfish, for me, I think of, you know, freshwater catfish. And it turns out these catfish are very tolerant of saltwater conditions. And uh, the fact that the mud crabs like to eat the oysters in North Carolina, their primary predator are toadfish, whereas down here it appears that it's the catfish. Catfish weren't the only surprise in store for David. Individual sites had some of their own unique situations. In St. Augustine, so just north of the frost line on the Atlantic side, 
the crown conch, the majestic looking snail, which is present on oyster reefs in the Gulf Coast, but is at benign numbers, is at exploding numbers there. And when you look on the oyster reefs, you're like, wow, it's obvious. And so that's been an interesting surprise that we're pursuing independent of this larger research project. Side projects being pursued alongside the larger study provide additional data with which to test their theories. Across Alligator Harbor from David and Randall's study reefs, they're conducting another such study. Baymouth Bar is this really cool site that you just really would never know was there especially at high tide, it's just underwater. I didn't know, but apparently here, it's home to the most diverse predatory snail species, supposedly in the world. So that's pretty cool. So you got lots of different snails of lots of different sizes roaming around this mud flat that when the tide goes out, you can see it all. If you go out there and start looking around, you'll see tons of sand dollars and then all these different kinds of snails. And we like to say they're large predatory gastropods, large predatory snails, with large being, you know, this being kind of the largest size. But still, they're pretty impressive. In the 50s was studied by probably one of the more famous ecologists in the world today, Bob Payne. He was looking at how higher order snail predator, the horse conch, which people leave it alone, it can be as big as a football. How does it organize this whole community by eating smaller things, which then eat fewer clams in the sediment? Horse conchs are the largest predatory snails in Florida waters, where they eat bivalves and other predatory snails such as whelks. The horse conch will use its superior size to overwhelm the smaller snails and use its proboscis to consume the soft flesh. When the tide goes out on the turtle grass beds in Baymouth Bar, horse conchs retreat into their shells. This lightning whelk may very well have been saved by the tide. This whelk was not. When Bob Payne went out and kind of detailed all these predatory snails on Baymouth Bar. He was kind of the first to suggest um, the whole concept of a, a food web and the fact that it's not just the top predator eats the intermediate consumer, eats the bottom, the plant or what have you, but that often there'll be all these links where some things will eat the same things as other organisms. And so it's more of a web than a chain. Basically the oyster study we're looking at is how, well, how does fear fit into this? And so it's, it's a different system, but it's the same kind of question. Okay, well, if we re-examine the system and think about things not only in terms of predators consuming prey, but also predators making prey scared, ultimately trickling down to affect clam behavior and clam filtration of the water, how do these things work in a different system? Do they work the same as they are on our oyster reefs? If so, great. That means our results are a little bit more solid. It's not just the idiosyncratic nature of one system. It's, hey, it's, it's operating in two different systems. In the intertidal community, it's hard to do things there when the water's in. And so you're always limited by the tide on how long and when you can go out and work on these oysters. So when the tide's out, you're on it, and then when the tide comes back in, guess what? You're done. The tides become even more of a challenge when coordinating multiple sites over a short period. In October of 2010, the oyster teams took this challenge in earnest to implement a new experiment. David's team began making use of a boat modified to operate in shallow water. In October, with all this background data being collected on the predatory assemblage on reefs and what the reefs look like, we wanted to see one direct evidence of down here in Florida is the rate at which small oysters are eaten faster than the rate they're eaten by mud crabs up in North Carolina. But also we wanted to get at traits of the oysters. So um, these predators like mud crabs or, or their predators could be affecting um, the size of oysters if they're scaring them and so that they're feeding less. This is a spat tile. They left three tiles, caged, 
open an open cage on every test reef. We had to go into the reef and again extract more oysters and then look on the adult oysters for little oyster settlers. See these things in my sleep. And if <laughs> the oyster settler was on a, a dead large shell, we then use this Dremel, just a little mini saw to saw it out. So that the little oyster wasn't sawed, but a chunk of the dead oyster it was attached to was. To ensure that the spat survived, it had to be back on the reef within a day or two. 24 spat on 15 tiles per site, that's 360 in a day. It was a lot of work. However, You could use this supposed to be crazy super glue to affix the juvenile oyster to the tile. And so through lots of effort and good teamwork, we got that to work, but it turns out that our glue wasn't so super and crazy. And that a lot of the oysters were lost probably not to being eaten, but to just simply flaking off because the glue failed. So we'll be redoing that experiment for the second time this summer using uh, better cages and better adhesive. And, uh, you know, you know it's kind of sad to think about all that effort and perhaps it was wasted, but it's just, you often have to waste a lot of effort to figure out how to do something correctly. You have to really map out these experiments. I mean, I spent a long time typing everything out um, and going over it with my crew. Um, and then invariably we still will kind of run a trial or just go ahead and run a first run if it's not too um, difficult of an experiment just to kind of get all those uh, mistakes out of the way and figure out what it is that you really need to be doing. So just like setting up your initial study site, you got to make mistakes and get that all the way and then figure out what didn't work, why, and fix it and then redo it. This is a prototype for the new tiles they'll be deploying. It shares a reef with a prototype cage for a new experiment. The experiment and the tiles were to be deployed in summer of 2011. And so now it's year two and we have seen some really cool food web and environmental patterns from North Carolina to Florida. And um, year two is now to pare back the number of reefs that we're looking at and to go into those reefs and devote a lot of resources and time to manipulating um, the identity uh, and presence of trophic levels to see exactly by manipulating things, you can say, oh, well, this top trophic level is definitely doing this down here in Florida. But up in North Carolina, this trophic level is doing that. David and Randall have both made use of enclosed experiments that recreate conditions found in nature. These allow researchers to control various aspects of the environment, such as removing or adding different proportions of specific species. Randall conducted one such experiment for a separate study on salt marsh biodiversity. So one aspect of the trophic cascade in the salt marsh is cord grass or spartina is not the only plant that occurs in the salt marsh. And one of the other really common plants in this area is juncus or needle rush. It gets its name honestly, it's very pokey and not very fun to work with. And one thing that we noticed when we were out in these marshes is that these marsh periwinkles have been documented to consume cord grass and that's thought to be their primary plant that they like to uh, associate with. But we found that in these patches where you have needle rush and cord grass growing together, you'd have even more snails than you did when it was just cord grass. And we thought that was kind of unusual. And so we've been doing a series of experiments trying to figure out why that might be. Do they like to eat the needle rush and that's why they're there? Or it's actually taller than cord grass, so maybe it's a better refuge from blue crabs. It's harder for blue crabs to reach them if they're higher out of the water. We uh, have these cages that are either cord grass growing by itself or cord grass growing in conjunction with needle rush. And we have some where we add snails and some where we keep the snails out. Because one of the things about these two plants is they're actually competitors. So the cord grass and the juncus, when they grow together, usually one of them will win. The new oyster experiment also uses manipulated habitats, but it has a few more moving parts. We conceive of it initially just trying to improve upon things we've already done in these small little baby pools in the lab. And so now we want to say, okay, let's take it out in the field, but we have to have some kind of control be maintained over the system so that if we want certain things here, we need to figure out a way to keep them there. But then we don't want other things getting in there that we didn't purposefully put there because we want to say that this reef turned out this way because of we 
we did this to it, right? So that's the whole idea behind a, a manipulative experiment. A great deal of preparation goes into the experiment. Several treatments for removing mud crabs from oyster clumps are tested. Removing the crabs ensures that any mud crabs present in the experiment's cages were placed there with a purpose. So we decided to go with the straddle design. In May of 2011, one month before the experiment is set to begin, all of the collaborators meet to finalize the experiment protocol and build some cages together. It is crucial that the experiment be carried out consistently across all sites. Therefore, the team leaders must all be on the same page. One of the great things about the fact that we're collaborating with people that we know really well is that communication is really key when you have a project that you're trying to do as exactly as possible in multiple locations. You know, it's really just to get behind our predator assemblages, whether they be the same or different. Are they acting and affecting oyster reefs and the services they provide in the same fashion from North Carolina to Florida, or are they doing things very differently? And so that might be important for people expecting to restore reefs down here and recover a certain service, when in fact our research might so show that maybe you shouldn't expect that service to occur because here predators do this versus that. The need for restoration is critical. A study released in 2009 by the Nature Conservancy indicates that disease and overharvesting have taken 85% of the world's oyster reefs. And of the remaining reefs, many are performing well below their historic output. In the Chesapeake Bay of Virginia, these reefs in their more pristine status were almost navigational hazards because they are so large. So under the water they were 10 feet tall and then kilometers long. Oyster reefs are not likely to ever grow to those sizes again. That, however, does not diminish their value. Every system along the coast has its purpose. The salt marsh, the seagrass bed, the sand flat, and the oyster reef. These and other coastal habitats are useful to more than just the critters that live there. Some of the benefits are easy to measure, but while you can hold an oyster on the half shell, other services are less tangible. For instance, marshes and reefs help control erosion by accumulating sediment, and they clean the water. Even less quantifiable is that these places are just cool. They offer a sights both beautiful and strange. It might be, though, that all they give us is, in some part, facilitated by fear.